republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Seat. Okay, let's go ahead and get into our agenda. Uh, the opening remarks. The first thing I think uh, I want to bring to your attention or remind you probably is that now that the elections are over, uh, now we still got a continuing job. We have to make sure that those elected personnel hear from the populace and what the voter is voted for that supported them. And so we need to write a letter, talk to them, uh, send them emails, anything that you do. Because in an elected position, uh, you have to know what the, the electorate desires. That's the easiest way that I can explain it. It's not the individual that is elected, but it's the job that they do for their particular job. And we have a key elected official here today, and we'll call you on you for a minute in a minute or two to say something. That guy that's sitting right next to you has probably got something to say too. But I think that she understands how to react to the populace, that is the voter. And I think that uh, now that you say, well, the election is over, that's it. It's not it. It's just starting. Yeah. And you have a responsibility to continue to work with whoever you voted in the office, or you didn't, whatever it is. Because that's what the free national objective is, is the freedom of, of the press, freedom of, of your speech, whatever you want to do, whatever talk you talk about. And I think that it's important that you write it down in your little black book and uh, you start uh, adhering to that. Because you'll be surprised how many times that uh, people will react differently to a different person and you can talk to them on the same subject. So it takes a field of you in order to provide the elected official with the information that they need. And so that's part of the election process, and I think that uh, you probably need to think on that. I think that probably the next thing that I should mention to you is uh, we've had some problems with some of our elected officials. I think the two representatives that we have at the present time are very nice people. And they want to do this the right thing. I'm not sure they know exactly how to do it. Uh, Vandewick is an example. You can't help but like the guy. He's just a good individual. And he's a typical Dutchman. It's not that it's the name, it's him. You look at him and you say, this is a good guy. But <coughs> you need to watch how he votes and you need to uh, talk to him on it. And on Steve Ferringer, I mean, again, a nice individual, and he always, whenever we would go down to uh, live here or anything, he would always come out and talk to us. The last time that, he, that we were down there, he'd come out in the hallway to meet, to meet us. Uh, and so he's receptive to, to information, and I think that you should uh, remember that. Now, we've had some bad ones. How about Evan Jones? Everybody remember Evan Jones? Evan Jones was a disaster. He was never elected to a position. Even our guest speaker knew him. Uh, he, he was appointed to jobs because of the party. Uh, it first was the death of a commission, county commissioner. He was elected by the Democratic Party to fill that position. Had no idea <clears throat> what the job was <clears throat> or how to do it. And I remember one of the meetings that we had with him, and I'll tell you look right up front, we fired him. And the reason that we fired him was because he was not doing his job. And uh, 
I remember that uh, one of the uh, those meetings, he said, well, if you guys don't support me, I'm not going to support you. He just cut his throat. And you don't want a representative that has that type of an attitude. And that's a poll. And I think maybe you should remember it. You know, because I don't know where he is or what he's doing, but we sure don't want him back. I can tell you that. But that's how important it is to uh, be up and running on this. On the Senate side, we got Jim Hargrove. He's the best conservative the Democrats have ever had. Yeah. He, he physically uh, goes with his job and he works hard at it. And whenever you go down there to talk to him, he drops whatever he's doing unless there's a session going on and sits down and talks to you. And he listens. And you know you can talk to a lot of people, but not everybody listens. Yeah. And that's another lesson I think that you need to remember. I know you said it already, but just remember. So most of those, those, or all of those people that are down there are very important to us. And as you know, uh, Jones was defeated by Jim Buck. And Jim Buck went put in three uh, election sessions. So he did a great job. Uh, so it was quite a change. And, and I think that uh, we should think back on some of those things. Because history repeats itself. And most of you are old enough to know that because you see that happen over and over and over again. <coughs> and, uh, so it's just something to kind of put in the back of your head. Now let's uh, talk about our guest speaker. I think everybody knows him. Everybody knows he's been around for a long time. Everybody knows, and if you don't, well, you're going to know, Come up from the ranks, from the very lowest if you could be, right on up to the position where he is at right now. Uh, and now he's going to retire after 30 years, and uh, I don't know uh, how that's going to happen, but I can tell you one thing, and I can plant a seed maybe with you. One of the best ways of running an office is to hire with him, because the people have the experience, they know what to do, and they know how to do it. I've seen three, now maybe two, yeah. uh, two of the chiefs of police were come up through the ranks, and he is the second one, and I think that he might, I want to plant a seed in his mind, where that he can bring his deputy up and replace him. Why pay $2,000 or $20,000 for a headhunter to come in that doesn't know the area, doesn't know the business, and doesn't know the detail? Where you point the point within, you bring the experience up with you. And it's, it's there available and immediately. All you do is just take, change chairs. And uh, it'll happen and it works. So I, I know what uh, you may mention that when you're talking, but uh, it's probably a number one in your, in your mind. So Chief, the floor is yours. Uh, you have uh, up to 30 minutes if you need. Uh, I'll be sitting right there, and then we will have comments and questions, and we hope we have a lot of questions on the floor. Good crowd. Thank you. Thanks. Well, you may wonder what the difference is between Colonel Roberts here and Chief Gallagher. And the single biggest difference is his uniform still fits. So, so, so I've been a police officer uh, with the city of Port Angeles for 31 years, uh, this month actually. And uh, that began back in the early 70s when my brother Steve, my brother Steve was also a police officer for the city of Port Angeles. He later moved on to the city of Olympia and he was a, he, uh, he was a police officer in the city of Olympia. He retired after 28 years. And believe it or not, he's now a Catholic priest uh, in Wrangell, Alaska. <clears throat> so along the way, he got married. He had a daughter. He's got a very interesting life story. You should have him here someday. He's a lot more interesting than I am. But in the early 70s, he called me up. He had, he had, got, he had been pulling Reagan out of the woods, working for Eclipse Timber. And he got involved as a uh, reserve police officer. And he called me up and he said, man, Terry, you really ought to do this. This is a lot of fun. And I told him no, 
that wasn't something I was the least bit interested in, but he eventually talked me into it, and I went down and I was a reserve police officer for a couple of years. In 1977, I went to the Army. I was in the Army for three years as a military police officer. Um, I got out of the Army in 1980, and I told my wife, who I met while I was in the Army, she's my one Army souvenir. I still have her. Um, I'll never do that job again. It just, all we did was fight with drunk soldiers, and I was just sick and tired of it. So I came back to Port Angeles in 1980, and a friend of mine had opened Lighthouse Marine. Some of you may remember that. And he'd written me a, a letter when I was in the Army, and he said, I need a parts and service manager. Can you come back and do that? And so it was really good in the early 80s, if you remember the economy back then. The prime rate was 21%. Our boats were floored at two points over prime, 23%. It was like buying all your inventory with a bad credit card. But it was really good to have a job waiting. And so I came back um, to Port Angeles. Uh, I went to work there. That business lasted until about 1984 or so, uh, and then it went bankrupt, um, really because of, I don't want to say it was intentionally, but if you remember, Paul Volcker was running the Federal Reserve back then with a mandate to break the back of inflation in this country, and he was successful at that, but it drove small businesses all across the United States out of business. So <clears throat> the business went bankrupt, and I didn't have a job, and that had never happened to me before. So I started working part-time in the lumber store. I started driving the truck a little bit, doing whatever I could to keep my house, because we had just bought a house, and my wife was pregnant with our first child. And one day, I opened the newspaper up, and there's an ad for the city of Port Angeles and the Clark County Sheriff's Department. They were testing for police officers and deputy sheriffs. And I told my wife, I'm going to go take that test, because I needed a job. And after a while, I was fortunate enough to get hired, and 31 years later, here I am. I went back to school uh, during that time, finished my education, did the things that I needed to do to qualify for this job. Um, so it's been an interesting career path, because had you asked me when I was 35, what are you going to be doing when you're 62, I wouldn't have told you I'm going to be the police chief of the city of Port Angeles. That was never, ever my plan, but I have to tell you that, I, that it's worked out well, and this community has been really good to me. Uh, my family settled this area in 1887. We've been here for a long time. It's important to me, um, the quality of life in this area is important to me. And it's important to me that we have a quality police department. One of the messages I want to leave you with today is that the city of Port Angeles is blessed with an outstanding police department. And that's, that's not just something that I can take credit for, although I'm proud of that. It's, it's the result of years of work on the part of a number of people. I think probably you may remember when Steve Oak was the police chief. Um, the last police chief before me was Tom Rippey. Before that was Steve Hill. And one of the things that Steve Hill did was he changed the educational standards, the entry-level educational standards for our police officers to require a two-year college degree or an equivalent number of credits. So 85% of the police departments in the United States only require a high school education. Fifth, about 15%, the balance, a little less than that, require the two-year degree, and a very small percentage require a bachelor's degree. So people tell me all the time, well, you know, I, I can be a police officer, but you don't only need a, a college education, or you don't need a college education in order to be a police officer. Well, those kind of comments are always interesting to me because these same people send their kids to college. Why do you send your kids to college? It has value. And, and, and I would point out that in the 1960s, if you remember the video, if you remember watching television, the riots on our college campuses, and how the police officers responded to those students. Remember the Chicago cops wading through with their clubs beating the heck out of everybody? That, that environment resulted in the production of a, of a report that you should all someday read called Crime in a Free Society. The Johnson administration commissioned that report. And in the 1960s, that report said all police officers should have bachelor's degrees. That the job is so sophisticated, and we ask so much of these men and women, that we should require a certain level of education if we want them to perform the way we want them to perform. And so here we are, 50 years later, and we still don't require that. I'm a big proponent of education in law enforcement. I'm a big proponent of training. Colonel Roberts, I'm sure here, could tell you that you fight like you train. The military knows that, so do we in law enforcement. <coughs> Training is important. And we have spent a number of years going back to Steveville, furthered by Tom Rippey, and now the last several years with some really quality people in the police department, developing an organization that isn't just good at law enforcement, it's, it's a culture that people want to be a part of. 
So when I first came into law enforcement, we used to go to the MNC Tavern when the swing shift got over. You guys remember the MNC Tavern? Yeah. And yeah, now it's called the Odyssey Bookstore. <laughs> so it was a lot more fun when it was the MNC Tavern. I can tell you that. But the whole ship would go to the MNC Tavern at 11 o'clock at night. Everybody's drinking beer and that kind of stuff. We're not talking about bad people breaking the law. We're talking about a culture that existed at the time that has disappeared from our case law. Now these guys are little league coaches. They, you don't see the drinking. You don't. One of the rules in our police department, this might sound kind of funny to you, but, but it's against the rules to use the F word. Well, if you ever pulled Reagan out in the woods or worked around a bunch of guys, you know, that's pretty common. You don't see that kind of thing. That, that the people that work at the police department will tell you it's a wonderful place to work. And it's a wonderful place to work because of the quality of people that we hire. So I just want to leave, with that, leave you with that message. You as a community want to pay attention to your law enforcement organizations. You know, Craig Ritchie is a local attorney, and Craig did a lot of defense work back when I was a detective sergeant. And Craig and I politically are sometimes polar opposites, hard as that is to believe. Um, and, you know, Craig told me one time, you should never trust your government. Well, I think that's true. You should trust your government. You should pay attention to your law enforcement agencies. You should pay attention to the kind of people that are wearing these badges that have the kind of authority that you've given to us. You're blessed in this community with good, quality young people, and the future of the Port Angeles Police Department, in my mind, is bright, but you want to make sure it stays that way. And the way you do that is to make sure the right people get promoted, and you have the right leaders in place to drive that culture. It's not possible for a police chief, all by himself, to make sure you never have a bad cop. I don't work at 3 in the morning. I'm 62 years old. I can't stay up past 10 o'clock. I'm sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> the way you prevent corruption in a law enforcement agency is you hire people that don't believe in the thin blue line. You hire good people that won't put up with corruption in a law enforcement agency. Because as a police chief, I need you to come and tell me you've got a problem with this police officer. When you look at corruption scandals in law enforcement across the country that periodically pop up, you find some things that are, are constants. And one of them is, Dade County, Florida, years ago, lowered their hiring standards. For political reasons. They lowered their hiring standards. And so what did they end up hiring? They ended up hiring a bunch of convicted felons that ran one of the most efficient drug operations out of the Dade County Sheriff's Office that the country had ever seen. How did the corruption scandal in the Rampart Division of Los Angeles happen? It happened because the cops let it happen. What I tell people that work for me, my sergeants for example, is if you watch this young officer right here walking off a cliff about to lose their career, and you just stand there and watch, when I fire him, I'm firing you at the same time. That your job as a leader is to help these people be successful. And I believe that we've, that we've done a good job of that over the years. And yes, we fired a few over the years. It's been several years now, but we have done that. So that's your police department in a nutshell. There's 32 officers in the city of Port Angeles. We have about 60 employees. People say, oh my god, so many people. Well, we run a 24-7 dispatch center. So 22 or so of those people run the dispatch center and are not available to do police department work, really. It's a separate organization. It takes 22 guys, you know, if you think about how many people it takes to run a 24-hour-a-day operation 365 days a year, build in days off, sick time, training time, vacation, things like that, you need to hire five people, 4.6, uh, to fill that chair 24 hours a day. 365 days a year. And so we, we staff three dispatchers at a time. They dispatch for all police and fire agencies in, in Collin County except for Nia Bay. There's 17 of them. Um, and they are very, very busy people. So just briefly on that, <coughs> you can tap I get I'm Irish, I talk a lot. The, uh, the dispatch center, our call volumes have gone up astronomically over and our staff has not. And the best example of that is the Port Angeles Fire Department has one less firefighter today than it had 25 years ago. So a lot of people don't know that. And their call volume has increased 257%, something like that. So <clears throat> we have staff needs in the, police, in the dispatch center, but we don't have the money to fill those needs. Three dispatchers really isn't enough to do what we're asked to do. So a couple years ago, 
what we when we started to look at our organization and analyze how we're doing business, we knew that we had uh, public safety agencies, police and fire, that have, have an ownership attachment to their radio frequency. Fort Angeles Police Department has its own radio frequency. Hog County Sheriff Department does. Fire District 2, all these different guys. So you got one dispatcher trying to monitor seven or eight radio frequencies. If you put one public safety unit on that radio frequency, that dispatcher now has all these different frequencies trying to stay in touch with all these different units, just seven or eight. It's very difficult. At the same time, they're answering the 911 calls, they're running the data entry, they're doing all this stuff. So we changed what we call zone dispatch so that now all the public safety units, all the law enforcement units in the central zone, which is McDonald Creek to Lake Crescent, operate on the same frequency. Everybody east of there is on the same frequency. That's east. Everybody west of Lake Crescent is on the same frequency. So now you've got one dispatcher that can handle 40 units because she only has to listen to that one radio instead of seven radios. It's much more efficient and it slowed the need for us to grow our staff, which saves us all kinds of money. And the next step in the future of dispatch is I'm going to retire March 4th. And in retirements, those kind of things create opportunities. That's how I think you should look at it. Okay, here's an opportunity. What can we do with this? And we're going to we're going to change the way dispatch is handled on the Olympic Peninsula. Jefferson County runs its own 911 center. Plowing County runs its own 911 center. Ours costs two and a half million bucks a year to run. Theirs is 1.8, somewhere right in there. If we melded those two, you could save substantial amounts of tax dollars, tax dollars over time. But how you meld them is the question. And so we have, um, when I retire, a couple other things are going to happen in the police department, but our current 911 manager, Steve Romer, wants to step down from his position. So our plan is to hire Carl Hatton, who's the Jefferson County 911 director, and he's a very smart guy. Um, and he used to work for us as a supervisor uh, as the Jefferson County, Clallam County 911 director. And his job will be to meld these two organizations. Generally, that's a three, four, or five year process. And it's very good. Um, but that's something that needs to happen. Those kind of efficiencies need to happen if we're going to continue to operate effectively as public safety agencies. The fact is, from a technology perspective, you can put your dispatch center anywhere. You can put it in if we want to. <clears throat> um, but if we're going to keep it here, and there's good reason why we shouldn't, uh, if we had a 9-0 earthquake, you'd be really happy your 9-1 center was here instead of somewhere else in the world. Um, then we need to find ways to bring efficiencies of that operation, and merging that 9-1, the 9-1 center from the peninsula is a way to do that. We know that uh, as many things as we can possibly combine in a single operation, so that we all, Sheriff's Department, PAPD, SQPD, we're not all running uh, the same thing, but we're running them separately. Neighborhood Watch is an example. Uh, we used to all have neighborhood watch, neighborhood watch programs. Now we do it under the umbrella of the Sheriff's Department. We share our volunteers, that kind of thing. Port Angeles Fire Department shares their volunteer crew with Fire District 2. It's much more efficient. So let me talk about crime just a little bit. So I've been doing this job a long time. And I get a lot of comments right now because of our heroin problem. People say, it's never been this bad. <coughs> it's never been this bad. It's the worst it's ever been. Well, that's fine, except statistics, the statistics don't support your opinion. You know, somebody told me once that every generation thinks the succeeding generation is going to hell. You know, I'm sure that your mom and dad, when they watched you guys marching during the 60s, thought you were a bunch of lunatics. But you seem to have survived that. I know my mom and dad, when my hair got long and stuff, probably thought I was a lunatic, but eventually Uncle Sam cut it off for me and straightened me out. So I, I just, uh, I think sometimes that we, we, we operate uh, more from emotion than from fact. The fact is, crime in this area is pretty stable, and it has been for several years. If you want to look beyond that and look at crime in the United States, violent crime in America has plummeted over 20 years, over the last 20 years. Absolutely plummeted. So I think the highest murder rate in the United States right now is the city of Chicago. They're getting a lot of press for being the most violent city in America. Detroit gets a different kind of press. But how many annual, how many murders annually are happening in Chicago? Anybody know? It's about 700. 
How many people were getting killed in LA and New York back in the 70s, late 60s, annually? 2,800. So there's a, great, there's a great book out on the market called Ghetto Side. And Ghetto Side was written by a, a reporter who um, embedded herself, as the term we use today, uh, in a homicide unit in LA, specifically in Watts. And she wanted to see how homicide investigations were conducted in these low income areas and that kind of thing. It's a really interesting book. But from my perspective, the really interesting part is the statistics. The murder rates in this country are a fourth, a fifth, what they were 20 some years ago. But we don't acknowledge that. It's the worst it's ever been. So if we look at robberies between 2013, 2014, or 2015 dropped a little bit. We had 16 robberies in 2013. We had 17 in 2014. Our 2015 stats are just coming in. We had 15 robberies. That's pretty stable. So I could say they've gone down. The fact is, 16, 17, 15, really it's pretty stable. And that's true with all these different statistics, except burglaries went up a little bit. Or actually burglary. Yeah, burglaries went up from 186 to 199 inside the city. I think the county numbers are going to maybe be higher than that. The thing that really is killing us this year, the one crime that just went off the charts, is vehicle prowls. Vehicle prowls in the city of Port Angeles 2011, there were 179, 2012, 121, 2013, 166. All of a sudden, we get to 2015. At the end of the year, we have 377. So, obviously, that's an issue. That's a problem. What are you going to do about it, Terry? Not much. And here's why. There's 124 miles of roads and alley in the city of Port Angeles. 124 miles. We work three or four, three or four, officers at a time. Where do you want me to put them to stop the vehicle problems? If I give you 60 miles of road and tell you I don't want any crime on that road, you're going to fail. Guaranteed. The single most effective thing people can do to stop vehicle problems is lock your car. Almost every single vehicle prowl is to an unlocked vehicle. In the high 90s, 98% of that. Now, <clears throat> does that mean that nobody ever breaks into a car? No, sometimes people break into cars. But it's rare, frankly. And if they do, it's because they're looking right at your purse or your Christmas present. So, I mean, that kind of stuff happens. But crime prevention is a two-way street. People have to accept responsibility for their personal safety and the quality of life in their community. And some people don't want to do that. They call me up and tell me that. It's your job. I should not have to do anything. Okay, in an ideal world, I agree with you. You should not have to do anything. In fact, you shouldn't have to work. You shouldn't have to do anything. Somebody should always care for you. I just don't buy that rationale. The fact is, my, bur my house got burglarized. Or not my house, my garage, about a month ago or so, four or five weeks ago. So, <coughs> Terry, you, you moron, how did that happen? I left my garage door on them. I've got all these exchange students that are in and out, and they're on their bikes, so I always leave a door unlocked so that they can get in and out. And I told my wife, because I really like woodworking and stuff, and I got some nice tools. You know, if anybody ever comes in here at night, they're really going to enjoy being here. So one night, it finally happens. After 30 years, somebody finally burglarized my garage. Well, why would I do that? I mean, I know better than that. Well, because I know what the odds are of me being a crime victim. It's about that much. The odds that something's going to happen are so small, I was willing to take that risk. And I lost. And my neighbor down the street's got cameras on his, on his uh, driveway. So it, there's a little bit of it shows this pickup truck coming down the street, headlights on, so somebody's driving it. And there's a guy walking next to him. And he's pulling on uh, mailboxes, looking for stolen mail. And he's pulling on door handles, looking to see what cars are on what. So they're trying to do car prowls or steal mail until they get to my garage and they find an open door. So they stop. All the stuff they've stolen from the people down the street was in my garage. Because they had better things to pick up. All you know, my tools are in plastic cases and stuff like that. And my kid, God bless him, had just he had a job where he had to get some tools, so I bought him some tools for his birthday. 
Well, the Jeep that he drives has got an alarm, but it's malfunctioning. So if you lock the Jeep, no matter what you do when you open the door, the alarm goes off. And he got really tired of that, so he wouldn't lock his Jeep. He moved all the tools into the garage where they'd be safe. <laughs> did you catch the guy? No. And that's something, you know, once, you know, I may know who did it, but many times cops know who did something, we just can't prove it. Um, and once stolen property disappears, the recovery rate on stolen property is less than 10% property. Once things go into the drug world, it's very seldom you get things back. People think about pawn shops, but really the pawn shops in our community do business the way it's supposed to be done. They're very cooperative with the police. You know, they do everything they can to do it right. So, well, where is it then? I come to your house and trade it for, you know, some oh, heroin or something so like that. Yeah. You know, they just, I just got an email a little while ago that there was a guy living south of the city here that had built a false wall in his, his shed. But I'm telling you the whole story. When they finally got behind the wall, they found a bunch of rifles and all kinds of stuff. I mean, there's, there are people that make their living as criminals. You know, we deal with them all the time. And, uh, and you know, one of the things that frustrates me, I can tell you one thing. It's done. <laughs> one, of, one of the things that really frustrates me is when people jump all over the police. The cops don't do anything. The cops are stupid. The cops are this. The cops are that. That irritates me because we hire across the board in this in Clown County the best people we can find to do law enforcement work. You are so lucky to have the quality of law enforcement that you do. And you know who tells me that? It's not the people that live here. It's the people that move here. People that move here think they've died and gone to heaven. People that grew up here think we've got a horrible crime rate and everything's going to hell in a handbasket. But if you move here from Stockton, California, or Sacramento, California, or the hillside in Oklahoma, you're feeling pretty good about living in this area. You know, your, your public safety people work hard every day. And they deserve, and they need, frankly, your support to be effective. I'm sorry. Uh -oh. Oh, uh, That's the fire. Uh, Ever wonder why did the fire guys go under with their siren? Do you know that Dan McKean is our city manager now? He used to be a fire chief. He wears hearing aids. Ken Dubuque, the new fire chief that replaced him, he wears hearing aids. <laughs> why don't you turn your siren off? You never see the police doing that? We go with our lights on, but we don't go with our sirens on unless it's a certain kind of call. I noticed uh, uh, we were having a outside the city hall, actually, our church praying for you people and the rest yep. of the leaders. Uh, and I tell you, I don't know how many times we saw the sheriff blasting out of town at 6, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. They're going all Lights down. going, sirens blazing. We take uh, about 40,000, it's around 38,000 that one calls a year. If you looked at call rates in the city of Port Hansis, we take a call by every, I think it's 15 minutes or something. Well, we saw your people leaving with their sirens off. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the they're trying to she goes to your council meetings. How often do the medics drive by with their kid lights on? All the time. I think they do it on purpose. Oh, I think so. I'm trying to see if we're paying attention. That's right. Okay, let's get into the comments and questions. <coughs> You're on. Uh, I have a theory. I'd like to hear your opinion on it. But uh, I have a concealed carry permit that I've got. And uh, a while back, we were, when we were working on this thing, I was asked to do a survey of how many concealed carry permits there are in Tonham County. Well, my survey told me that about, one, by dividing the number of <coughs> permits that have been issued in the last five years into the total uh, population, about one person out of nine this county has a concealed carry permit, and if you figure that out of the total population, probably half of them are kids, you're probably, uh, if, you're, if you're a crook, you've probably got about a one chance in four or five that, that your victim is armed. And I think that causes people who do want to live by crime move to Chicago or someplace like that where they have strict gun laws and they're not so likely to run into somebody who, 
might shoot back. What do you think of that? I don't think any criminal would ever do that research. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here's the deal. Violent crime in this area is, frankly, it's very rare. It's what we call stranger crime in law enforcement. If somebody shoots you, you probably know them really well. Yeah. You know, or somebody robs you or something like that. It's usually a quick and strict. It's very, very rare that we actually have stranger on stranger crime. Um, so, you know, as a police officer, do I care about an armed population? I can care less if everybody in this room is packing guns. You can carry six of them if you want to. Because there aren't anybody in this room, or is there anyone in this room, that I worry about. I just, I don't understand the focus on the tool instead of the behavior. Now, I've, I've read the research, I under, you know, I understand the issues that surround that. And, but I grew up in a family, you know, I grew up here, we had guns all over the place. And, and uh, I, you know, I just don't get hysterical about guns. I don't care how many guns you carry. Um, the fact is, uh, crime work in this area, for example, where guns are involved is really pretty rare. Uh, this is an opinion question. Uh, prescription drugs, are they a gateway drug into heroin? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, they had, a, they had an opioid question. Did you have a Are they being diverted from legitimate prescriptions or they come from? In some cases. What's that? Sometimes. So we had what's called, we called it an opioid summit at the hospital several weeks ago. It was really interesting. Um, the people that came here, especially the medical people that talked about how we got into the problem we're having with heroin today. And they acknowledged, this isn't me, this is them, saying in the early 90s, I think it was, hospitals changed the way they evaluated their performance, or the medical profession changed, and they began to evaluate hospitals on the basis of pain management. Well, that's an entirely subjective thing. You know, I, I dislocated my shoulder really bad once in a basketball game. And it, it had knocked me to my knees, but I stood up, and I was so mad, I wanted to hit the guy that landed on me. But I've seen other people do that, and they lay on the ground, and they're screaming and screaming and screaming. Pain is subjective. And so when the doctor says, you know, how are you feeling? Oh, man, it hurts like that. Is it the worst pain you ever had? Absolutely. You know? And if I say absolutely, are you going to give me a prescription for an opiate? Yes, I am. I had my, my uh, sister-in-law out here up until just a short time ago, she'd been injured and she came to our house and lived with us for a little over a year while she recovered. And she went to a doctor locally and she was given a prescription for hydrocodone, hydrocodone which is an opiate. She had, so she, she decides one day, sitting at the dinner table, she needs to take one of her pills. So she gets the bottle out of her purse. It's huge. It's a prescription for 300 pills. Oh, my God. Why would you do that? So. So what happened is hospitals, quite legitimately, I mean, they're trying to do a good thing, and they're trying to measure up to this pain management standard, but they turned us into a nation of junkies. And that's something people forget when they talk about heroin. Most people, when they talk about heroin, <clears throat> think they're talking about our homeless population of the Salvation Army. But you're not. You're talking about people across the board in all levels of society in Fort Angeles. We know, the sheriff said this the other day, he said, we know that we have pounds and pounds of heroin being brought into this area. Well, heroin is sold in what's called a match head or a point. So if you see a text on your kid's phone that says, you have a couple of points, you might worry about that. The, but why do they call it a match head? They call it a match head because if you think about a wooden match, a little head of that match, that's how much heroin you buy. You don't buy you know, this big thing. You buy this little match head. You put it in a spoon and you do your thing and shoot out your heroin. So when we know we've got pounds of heroin coming in, and we know it's being sold in what's called match heads, and we know it takes a whole lot of match heads to, to accommodate that pound, it gives you some idea of how many people are using heroin in this area that we don't know about. And it's a lot. I have a question about cooperation among the agencies, in particular the SWIM, the head of the SWIM, cooperation between the different police departments. You know, you can't, there isn't a law enforcement agency around here that's big enough to do what we're asked to do. So we cooperate all the time. We work together all the time. Bill Dickinson's a quality police chief. 
he might retire this year. In fact, you've got a better police chief than Cleo Anthony's there. Their police chief flies an airplane, sails a boat, plays the bagpipes, and he's a train guy. He travels all over the world just to ride on trains. He's a lot more interesting than I am. <laughs> but the fact is, is we can't we can't do our job without working with other agencies. Uh, can okay. you give us a snapshot on recidivism over your career in PA? Uh, you know, the revolving door of career criminals. Well, I've been saying this since I was a, you know, back in the late 80s, I was a DARE officer, and I used to teach the DARE program in our schools. And then I became a sergeant, and I was on the drug task force. And so I've been talking about some of this stuff for a long time. Uh, I can just tell you that my you know, opinion, after doing this job since I was 22 years old, is government makes a poor parent. If you raise your kid to be a criminal, and then you expect government to fix it, you will always be disappointed. I and mean, I really believe that. I have met people over the years that have gone off to prison and have come out and turned their lives around. But really, that's been rare. It's very gratifying when you see that, because it's possible. But you know, we were told a million years ago in the police academy that we deal a lot with psychopaths, sociopaths, really those terms are interchangeable. And they just they define that as someone with an undeveloped, with no conscience or an under, underdeveloped conscience. We don't know how to fix that. We didn't know how to fix it in the 80s. We don't know how to fix it today. And so some psychopaths are car salesmen. Some are criminals. You know, so I don't know. I think that recidivism is an issue. I think we work hard as a society to fix it. The, if, we, if we can solve the addiction problem, a lot of that would go away. You know, most, most um, we don't ever say uh, all drug addicts or, or addicts are criminals, but virtually all criminals are addicts. I mean, the percentage is so high, it's, it's, it's meaningless to, to think about it in some other way. You had a comment or a question? Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll go one right here. Um, I've heard about recently, but not too long ago, there was some kind of a drug that the police department was carrying now that if they come across an overdose, they're uh -huh. they administered. It seems to me like that's a liability for the city here, the police department. No, it's not. The reason it's not. No. Uh, he's talking about naloxone, and she used the term Narcan. Um, which are is the same thing, but naloxone was given to us free by a company called Evio, F -E and part of the agreement we had to sign is I can never use the word. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I can't use that. Word. I can't say that word. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so what naloxone is what they call an opioid antagonist. So we show up at a call. Uh, we and we're faster than the fire department almost all the time because we're not sitting in a building. We're out and about. Chances are some cop can get there faster than a, than a fire guy. We don't have the, the medical training, the level they do, but how many here were in the military, in the Army? See, do you remember what they gave you when, for nerve agents and blood agents? They gave you atropine. See, you remember the injectors? Yeah. You know, you carried three of them. If you got exposed to a nerve agent, you open that thing up and you jab it in your thigh. And you keep jabbing it until you're all better. And if three doesn't do it, you take your buddies and you use his. Because whatever the nerve agent's going to do to you is going to be a whole lot worse than whatever the attributes are going to do. The same theory applies with naloxone. You can't overdose on naloxone. It's very simple. You give it to the officer, you send them through some training, they show up at a scene, you got a heroin addict that's dying, or in some cases, as far as you're concerned, they look like they're dead. Um, and you, you, stand, you open the naloxone things and it tells you what to do. But really all you do is open it, jab them in the thigh, one, two, three, four, five, pull it off, and you're going to think Michael the Archangel has thrown up at your crime scene because this guy's going to sit right up and talk to you. It's almost scary. It's that fast. And if one doesn't work, give him another one. We've never had to do more than two. So is there a liability issue there? Well, there's all, in police work, there's always liability. You know, if you want to get sued, be a cop because sooner or later in your career, you're going to get sued. The, we also carry AEDs, the automatic defibrillators. There's liability associated with that as well, but it's the right thing to do. We have the ability to save lives. That's our responsibility. We should do that. And I, I, and I don't care if you're a drug addict or you're the mayor. Well, the, the fact is, if we can help you, we're going to help you. Um, 
and but specific to naloxone, there's state legislation. There's naloxone legislation. If you could look up, oh, that, that, and there's a Good Samaritan provision in it that specifically exempts you from liability so if you're using the marks in law. Okay, you got so, one over here. Um, I just have one question that has to do with the homeless, the suicide, and all this. Are we going to correlate it to just the drug issue, or is it the economy issue, or? I think I think it's that's a very complex subject, and people want simple answers. Right, and there is no simple answer. No. So, are we throwing these people in jail, and we're having to pay no. for them? Are they being, you know? That's that's an urban myth that, that uh, the chance you know if you look at the jail roster, the chances of somebody going to jail just it'll just say possession of heroin or possession of methamphetamine. It is so rare that people get arrested just for possession. And if you think about it, I don't know what's in Rod's pockets right now. I can't arrest you without knowing probable cause. I got to have some kind of reason to arrest you. So if you get if you get booked for heroin, it's almost always because you've been arrested for something else. Or a domestic violence is a good example. Or you're in talk, you're drunk driving, or we catch you shoplifting from Safeway. That's a real common thing. And we find the drugs when we search you incident to that arrest. So, you know, the jails are really not, the jails are full of people that have addiction issues, but the jails aren't necessarily full of people that are in jail strictly for drug violence. And the fact is, it's our drug court, which I'm a big fan of drug court. You know, if I get a minute, I'll talk about this program we're going to try and start here pretty soon. Um, is, you know, law enforcement can't solve the drug and anybody that ever told you we could was lying to you or ill-informed. No, law enforcement is the end result of a failed social problem. We, you know, we sweep up after society. That's what we do. And our ability to fix people is very limited. And the criminal justice system is punitive by nature. And it's changing very slowly with things like drug court and mental health courts. And, and then if, when you look at them and you say, oh, my God. Drug court is expensive. All of a sudden, we don't want to have drug court anymore. You know, the bottom line, I belong to a group of uh, Fight Crime Invest Invested Kids, which is a political action group. What it, what it works for is, you know, is, is uh, increased funding for childhood education and things like that. that that's really where our money ought to be. It ought to be at that end of the scale. The problem is, is that people want to do that by defunding their existing law enforcement agencies. They don't have enough people to do what we're asking them to do anyway. So what there needs to be is a longer-term strategy. Is how do we how do we build up this end without destroying this end? And maybe someday we reverse that that equation. But it isn't going to happen overnight, and it's going to happen. It's going to require uh, a certain level of leadership that I don't happen to think we have in this country. So that's true. I was going to ask about the defunding. It seems that many times the government doesn't have enough money, so we're going to cut fire and police. I'm wondering, is that a nationwide? Yeah, but it's part of it is people don't understand government budgets. The city of Port Angeles budget is really misleading for most people. It's hard to understand. Port Angeles is unique, relatively unique among cities, in that we own our own utilities. We have an electric utility, we have a water utility, we have a stormwater utility, we have a medic one utility. And then you have the general fund. <clears throat> the general fund is, is what pays for your police, fire, and parks, and your street repairs it, as a general statement. By law, you can take general fund money and you can move it this way. But you can't take utility money, sometimes those are called enterprise funds, and move it this way. It's illegal. So when you look at a hundred and, I think it's $20 million budget this year, you say, oh my god, they got all this money. Well, really what all people are always talking about when they talk about programs is this pot of money over here, the general fund, which is probably around $18 million. So your police department costs you $5 million. Bucks. Your fire department costs you another $5 million. Bucks. Your parks department, I forget where they're at now because we've grown our parks so much over the years. But by the time you fund police, fire, and parks, you don't have very much money left. So you look at your alleys and all your potholes and things and say, why don't they ever fix my alley? You know, and I'm going to say, well, why don't they hire eight more cops? So <clears throat> you're talking about a limited pile of money because you're always talking. Almost everybody that comes to city council 
when they want money is talking about general fund money. And the pie is only this big, and you can't give it to everybody. So, any more questions? Whatever happened to the DARE program? <coughs> DARE program, <laughs> you know, the DARE program uh, was eventually went away, and people said, some people will say, well, the DARE program doesn't work. Well, how about I explain that to you? Why doesn't it work? Well, we still have a drug problem. Well, then tell me what does work. Because really, the DARE program is part of a, of a three-legged stool. You've got enforcement, you've got education, you've got intervention. So if you evaluate anything, any effort, by whether or not it, it's, the problem still exists, the drug problem still exists, then we don't know anything that works. Addiction, there's nothing new about addiction. It's been around forever. Um, DARE was starting to take a lot of hits back in the early 90s. And so really it went away because it was easy to let it go. You know, I taught DARE for three years. It was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done as a police officer. Um, and I didn't want to do it. The chief ordered me to do it. He, I said, I don't want to do that. And he said, well, so here's exactly what he said. Maybe you ought to think about where you're going to be working tomorrow. <laughs> so I did that, and you know. And so the way I look at the way I look at the Dare program is, if you want police officers in the schools, the Dare program was a wonderful way to put them there. It really was. Okay. Just kind of a question: How did the new law that the public voted in on marijuana affect your workforce? Not in the least. Uh, you know, marijuana, one of the big lies, I think, in America is, is marijuana. Our prisons are full of people that didn't do anything more than smoke marijuana. That's never been true. People that go to prison for marijuana were guys that had 200, 300 plant grows that were making tons of money. Those same guys still exist, but now they all say they're medical marijuana guys. So, you know, marijuana, we can talk about marijuana all day long. But the fact is, law enforcement hadn't taken marijuana seriously for years because we couldn't. We got heroin, we got meth, we got a limited capacity jail. It was a complete waste of our time. So from that perspective, it really didn't impact us. Where it does impact us is, am I going to hire you if you're smoking weed? No, I'm not. And if you think that's unfair, I don't really care if you think it's unfair. You know, the fact is, it's illegal under federal law, and police officers don't break the law. So get a new chief if you want that policy to change. You're going to have that opportunity. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing is like DWIs. So people say, well, didn't that have an impact? Because you don't you know with, a, with an alcohol-based DWI, you pull out your little alka sensory, blows in it if you agree to, and you and you can establish certain things. Case law surrounding drunk driving, alcohol-based, is well established. It's, it's, you know, cops like bright lines. Do this, don't do that makes it a lot easier on a police officer. And, and so where alcohol is concerned, it's a right line rule, well established, we know what to do. Drugs are a little bit iffy. <clears throat> the biggest issue for us is if I talk to you, I can tell if I'm talking to you that you're under the influence of methamphetamine or heroin or weed. I'm going to know that. But no one had proven it are two different things. So in order to take you to court, I have to have a blood sample. That means I have to write a search warrant. So it, it is so much more time consuming. We've got to take you to the hospital, we've got to get the search warrant, we've got to get your blood drawn, your blood's got to go to the state crime lab and get analyzed. Now the hospital knows if you've got alcohol in your blood, because they do blood tests themselves, but we don't have access to that information. And just from a and they don't want their ER crew in court all the time. I mean that just isn't practical. So it, the whole process is all drawn out. And, that, and frankly, one of the great weaknesses in our criminal justice system is that the whole process is all drawn out. You know, if you think about when your kid did something wrong, you didn't, if he did something wrong in July, you didn't spank him in November. You know, but that's what we do. And so oftentimes the consequence we impose is so detached from the action that the, the bad guy can't, he doesn't relate the punishment to the crime anymore. He just thinks the judge, the judge is a jerk and Terry's picking on him. So, <laughs> there, excuse me, there's an interesting phenomenon occurring across the country right now where law enforcement officers and agencies are being targeted um, and so 
some cases murder. I'm wondering if that's um, a topic of concern or conversation here locally. Well, I mean, it's a topic. We, we talk about that sort of thing, and we train, you know, in certain ways. But, you know, if you, if you notice, a lot of these issues are happening back east. And I can just tell you that when you get east of the Rocky Mountains, the complexion of law enforcement changes completely. Now, remember the, the cop that shot the black guy in Charleston a few months ago? Yeah. North Charleston, the, the black guy turns, he's running away, the cop starts shooting at him, and he kills him. Now, without, I don't know the facts of that case, but from my experience, that's a clear murder. No question about it. The one in Chicago that got shot, the black kid, is, he's got a knife in his hand, but he's walking away from the officers. And now if you're walking away from the officers, but you're walking into a crowd of people, maybe I'm going to shoot you. Because I don't want you in that crowd, armed, that kind of thing. But in this case, he's walking away from the officers, and he's walking toward a fence. There's nobody around and this officer shoots him, and he goes down, and then he empties that whole gun, 15-round magazine, into this kid. That's a clear murder. There is no justification for those shootings, based on what I can see on those films, uh, under, under any deadly force theory that I'm aware of. <clears throat> and deadly force law hasn't changed in 30 years. I mean, it, it, it is so well established that, that we can shoot in defense of ourselves or in defense of one of you. There's all kinds of case law. One of the big problems we have in the United States is the American media in 30 years can't figure out deadly force law. You know, what you shoot at? Gosh, you know, couldn't you just wound him? <laughs> I don't know what anybody here knows about shooting, but a kneecap is that big around. And it's moving. So I want you to draw at nighttime while you're scared to death, and I want you to put a round right through that little thing. Okay, Matt Dillon could do that, I suppose. <laughs> but it's not practical. What you do see that causes so much of this controversy is misapplications, just bozo applications of deadly force. And that's where I talk about you want to hire the right people and you want to trade the heck out of them. The, uh, I looked at North Charleston's training, once, I looked at North Charleston's training standards after I saw that film. <clears throat> so high school education, we have a college requirement. Frankly, we haven't hired anybody for a while that doesn't have a bachelor's degree. And, and just so you know, you've got control officers on your police department with master's degrees in a variety of different subjects. Um, and then I looked at their training. The Washington State Basic Academy, Basic Police Academy, that you have to complete before you can be a cop in the state of Washington is 720 hours long. It takes five months. When you get done with that, you've got to go through a 14-week field training program where you learn things specific to your community, like Port Angeles Municipal Code, or what does Port Angeles Police Officers do when they get a bank loan? You know, things that are unique to our community. And then we send you out and we watch you very carefully. And when you're in a field training program, you get evaluated, a written evaluation every single day. You sit down with your training officer and they say, you did this right, you did this wrong. And that, and then you, the evaluations continue because in my mind it takes several years to train somebody to do police work effectively. The academy in, in uh, Charleston, North Charleston, that they attend is less than half what a Washington State police officer attends. And I think that academics, the people that are so concerned about police force, I would look more at, you know, race is the easy thing. Oh, I just shot him because he was black. How about if we look at the training? How about if we look at the hiring standards? How about if we look at the whole picture and try to figure out what's really happening? Because I don't think we do that very right Have you noticed that a lot of the shootings are being taken in gun-free zones? The ones here of late that have the mass shootings, they're all in gun-free zones. I have a, uh, I got a PowerPoint slide. It's on my phone, in fact, I think. <clears throat> Done by a Canadian academic university of Toronto or something like that. Now, what do the Canadians know about force? That's probably the first thing you're wondering. I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> and he looks at police shootings in the United States. And he, he's got really interesting statistics in there, and I don't have the time nor, frankly, the inclination anymore to figure out if he's right, but there's nothing to suggest he's got an agenda. The chances of a black guy being shot by a police officer in America are almost exactly the same as that same person being struck by lightning. Almost exactly. Carrying it out like 12 decimal. I don't think that we're having a sensible conversation about force in this country. 
gun-free zones, do I think they are very nice people. And they want to do this the right thing. I'm not sure they know exactly how to do it. Uh, Van der Wijk is an example. You can't help but like the guy. He's just a good individual. And he's a typical Dutchman. It's not that it's the name, it's him. You look at him and you say, this is a good guy. But you need to watch how he votes and you need to uh, talk to him on it. And on Steve Ferringer, and again, a nice individual. And he always, whenever we would go down to uh, the lift here or anything, he would always come out and talk to us. The last time that, he, that we were down there, he'd come out in the hallway to meet, to meet us. Uh, and so he's receptive to, to information. And I think that you should uh, remember that. Now, we've had some bad ones. How about Evan Jones? Everybody remember Evan Jones? Evan Jones was a disaster. He was never elected to a position. Even our guest speaker knew him. Uh, he, he was appointed to jobs because of the party. Uh, it first was the death of a county commissioner. He was elected by the Democratic Party to fill that position. And for all of those people that are down there are very important to us. And as you know, uh, Jones was defeated by Jim Buck. And Jim Buck went put in three uh, election sessions. So he did a great job. Uh, so it was quite a change. And, and I think that uh, we should think back on some of those things. Because history repeats itself. And most of you are old enough to know that. Because you've seen it happen over and over and over again. And uh, so it's just something to kind of put in the back of your head. Now let's uh, talk about our guest speaker. I think everybody knows him. Everybody knows he's been around for a long time. Everybody knows, and if you don't, well, you're going to know, come up from the ranks, from the very lowest that you could be, right on up to the position where he's at right now. Uh, and now he's going to retire after 30 years. And uh, I don't know uh, how that's going to happen. But I can tell you one thing, and I can plant a seed maybe with you. One of the best ways of running an office is to hire within. Because the people have the experience, they know what to do, and they know how to do it. I've seen three, now see two. Yeah. Uh, two of the chiefs of police were come up through the rank. No idea <coughs> what the job was <coughs> or how to do it. And I remember one of the meetings that we had with him, and I'll tell you look right up front, we fired him. And the reason that we fired him was because he was not doing his job. And uh, I remember that uh, one of the, uh, those meetings, he said, well, if you guys don't support me, I'm not going to support you. <laughs> he just cut his throat. And you don't want a representative that has that type of an attitude, yeah. and that's a pull. And I think maybe you should remember it, you know, because I don't know where he is or what he's doing, but we sure don't want him back. Yeah. I can tell you that. But that's how important it is to uh, be up and running on this. On the Senate side, we got Jim Marco. He's the best conservative the Democrats have ever had. Yeah. <laughs> He, he physically uh, knows that his job, and he works hard at it. And whenever you go down there to talk to him, he drops whatever he's doing, unless there's a session going on, and sits down and talks to you. And he listens. And you know you can talk to a lot of people, but not everybody listens. Yeah. And that's another lesson I think that you need to remember. I know you've said it already, but just remember it. Most of those have probably got something to say too, but I think that she understands how to react to the populace, that is the voter. And I think that uh, now that you say, well, the election is over, that's it. It's not it. It's just starting. 
and you have a responsibility to continue to work with whoever you voted in the office, or you didn't, whatever it is, because that's what a free national objective is, is the freedom of, of the press, freedom of, of your speech, whatever you want to do, whatever talk you talk about. And I think that it's important that you write it down in your little black book and uh, you start uh, adhering to that. Because you'll be surprised how many times that uh, people will react differently to a different person. And you can talk to the same subject. So it takes a field of you in order to provide the elected official with the information that they need. And so that's part of the election process. And I think that uh, you probably need to think on that. I think that probably the next thing that I should mention to you is uh, we've had some problems with some of our elected officials. I think the two representatives that we have at the present time